2019's media predictions, and Amazon's new ad strategy, Free Samples. Yum. Wow. This is episode 90 of Media Unplugged. I can't believe we've gotten that far. The podcast that goes behind the spin to reveal what's really happening in media. Media Unplugged with Tom A. Sacker and Mark Ramsey. Welcome to Media Unplugged. I'm Mark Ramsey. And I'm Tom A. Sacker. You certainly are, Tom. Uh, it's time for 2019, and that means it's time for 2019's media predictions. We're almost out of January. That's not too late for this, is it? Uh, I don't know. Since nobody ever gets them right, what difference is it? With my- <laughs> well, <laughs> this, is, this is from a piece in uh, TechCrunch, uh, 10 predictions about the media industry in the new year. And, you know, I, I think it makes sense to kind of skim over some of the no-brainer stuff, like, you know, prediction one. Blood continues to spill on the relentless battle among premium over-the-top video giants, Apple, Disney, etc., uh, and Netflix, uh, Amazon, etc., etc. I mean, you know, that's one of those. Next, this year will be more of what we saw last year, but on steroids. Conclusions, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's the spilling blood part. You know, that's that's the prediction that no one can make. So, App, Apple, Disney, Amazon, NBC, Universal—they're jumping in. To the free for all, right? But then you have Netflix that announced their biggest price increase ever, and the stock soared. It, you know, and so it's 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 interesting. Um, I, I, well, I have some useful information that I retained from my formal economics training. <laughs> it, Let me guess: it has to do with inelasticity of demand. There you go. <laughs> so you ch- the changes in price have a relatively small effect on the service demanded. Uh-huh. Be- because when you think about it, right, it's a couple bucks. I just got my cell phone bill this month, and I compared it to Netflix, and it's like, oh, it's whatever, insane. right? So- you know what, Tom? I-, I said to somebody the other day, I said, don't anybody tell Netflix, but the truth is we pay about three times the price for what we're getting from Netflix every month. I'm telling you, it's the other guys that are going to have the ble- the bloodbath. Hulu just dropped yeah. their ad-supported subscription by two bucks a month, you know. Right. So, right. so- Which is not cheap enough. Yeah, exactly. That's my point. <laughs> exactly. So, obviously, as part of this conclu- this uh, particular uh, prediction, originals, they say, continue to be a primary weapon, which is great for all the people in the business of producing originals and is tough for anyone who wants their original to surface because I don't know about you, but I can't remember the n- I can't remember from one day to the next what I started binging and what I stopped binging. Oh, it's funny because we were watching we were watching last night i think netflix but it could have been amazon because we just switched between them because the the apps are right on the same screen and we were going to watch something new but we had like a couple of things going (laughs) and i said look Mm -hmm. i I cannot follow the plot of three of these things let's try to finish one of them before we start another one yeah that's true the plots are so confusing is this the show that we and and then since some of the actors are you know duped across shows Wait a minute, is this the show where that guy did blankety blank? No, that's a whole different show. This is what I'm talking about. You know, yeah. it's like, and so, and, and it gets so confusing. Is that the good guy or the bad guy? I don't know. I thought he was a good guy. It doesn't look and like. I, <laughs> what that suggests, though, is that even though originals are key right now, this goes to your point about the bloodbath because eventually, you know, how many originals can there be? That said, if you're Disney, and you happen to have a very small number of very high quality jewels, which they do in in the form of, you know, Pixar and uh, Lucasfilm, right? Um, and uh, and and of course, you know, the Disney assets, uh, and and uh, Marvel. Um, you don't need a lot, you know. You don't. If if Hulu has proved anything, thanks to The Handmaid's Tale, it's that you don't need. A lot. What you need is one or two that are really, really strong, and everything else is just kind of taking is 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 the the raw material that helps me, the consumer, justify my expenditure, even though I really only go there for one or two things. That's it. If you're discovering new and desirable content every few months, something mm-hmm. that appeals to you. So let's say that you're in the genre of you know detective stuff, you know, <laughs> or mm-hmm. whatever it is, or spies or comedy, mm-hmm. or horror, and you look and you find one of your things, then you say, mm-hmm. okay, this is worth it. But if you go three or four months and you don't see anything new popping up, then you're going to start wondering, maybe I should jump over here. So that's you're yeah. right. It's, it's not about, 
how do I keep them hooked all day long? It's how do I make sure when they start having this feeling that nothing new is popping up, that all of a mm-hmm. something, all of a sudden, something new does pop up. That's so interesting because you know one of the big conversations I've had with some of my clients lately is this anxiety to change that which isn't broken that they have. The feeling like I got to get ahead of the demographic curve, I've got to get ahead of the taste curve, but I'm afraid to change something because it's not broken right now, even and it's been this way for 10, 15, 20 years. There's a radio station in my backyard here that I worked with years ago. It has the exact same logo that it had 30 years ago. <laughs> now, and it was a station aimed at people who weren't born 30 years ago. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think what something like this again demonstrates is there is an inevitable forward momentum Everything is changing. Everything has to change. There's inherent risk in that, and it's too bad if you don't like it because that's what fans, listeners, viewers are looking for. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'll, when we get to my rants and raves, I'll give you an example of that. that... Oh, perfect. <laughs> all right, let me skip ahead a little bit on these predictions because we're not going to cover them all. There's one prediction number three, the music industry. Their streaming-driven turnaround continues and streaming revenues accelerate, but... Your play music services like Spotify continue to hemorrhage money as losses mount. Meanwhile, of course, you got Apple, Amazon, YouTube, all these guys who are uh, who have business models that are about much more than music. Right? Music is a tiny piece of their whole business model, right. and as the piece says here, they are quote indifferent to that suffering with their bra- with their fundamentally different underlying marketing driven <laughs> business models. They're indifferent, Tom. Yeah, I know. Um, just like all I, of the retail outlets that have all those loss leaders. They are indifferent to the fact that they're not making any money on those. They just want you to buy all the other stuff in the store. <laughs> yes, it sounds like they're not necessarily indifferent. They're quite different, in fact. Exactly. They're quite using that to that. draw you in. <laughs> yes, which is, com- which is completely legitimate as much as the pure plays like Spotify might resent it. Um, and the, the th- piece goes on to say, look... There's, there's, there's likely to be more M&A activity. There's likely to be more consolidation. Uh, Sirius XM buying Pandora, Live by Live buying Slacker, which you know I know some degree about. Um, and then it says, unless it's is, uh, Spotify, unless it successfully expands its business model and drives major re- new revenue streams, it too could be bought. Facebook, anyone? Yeah. Remember the old days when it was always Apple's going to buy me or Google's going to buy me. Now it's Facebook's going to buy me. Yep. So I, I think it's a good point in that as much as streaming music is growing, as much as people want to get their music from, you know, from, from Spotify, and Spotify itself has grown tremendously, but it can't get out of the red ink. And you have to ask yourself the question, what's the escape valve here? What's the path out here? And it, the answer, in my mind, as it is here, keeps coming back to, well, whoever said that that was the only way you were ever going to drive revenue? through music why yeah. should by the way that's not the only, that's not even how musicians drive revenue i know <laughs> musicians drive revenue through live performance not through selling songs so why should we expect spotify's model to ultimately be effective for it because they wanted to <laughs> <laughs> as judge judy says well i want to be five foot nine and gorgeous uh, and she's five foot one in judge <laughs> judy um, another prediction, the use of AI, voice, and machine learning to dominate further and even broadly infiltrate our lives and impact our media and entertainment experiences. I found this fascinating because, you know, essentially what it says is, to date, AI has kind of influenced your choices. You know, it said people like you bought blank. Maybe you'd like blank because you liked blank, right? Right. Uh, here they're saying, no, AI has the potential to drive so-called intelligent creation, Tom. Okay. Intelligent creation. Well, Do you have? Not, yeah, I don't know. You're about to rant on this. Go ahead. Let me hear. No, it. no. What? Listen. This is this is a big deal, and it's really hidden. You know, because we don't really know what's going on with these guys. For example, you, you know, uh, Netflix's um, that interactive series, uh, uh, Black Mirror, Bandersnatch. Yes. Okay. Yes. So th- I want you to think about this. So it forces you to make all these kind of decisions, right? About what the main, what's going to happen to the main character? Right. Is he right. should he stop taking his pills prescribed by the therapist? Should he should he you know kill it and dismember his father? You know all of this crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. They're collecting all that data, 
So they know how your head's working. Right. That's going to have an influence of what they're going to do in the future with that data to feed back to you in, in various choices. I don't know what they're going to do with it. Look, what do you think Facebook is going to do with that information that we're unwittingly giving them when, when we interact with that, uh, that 10 year challenge, you know, that facial recognition, yeah. viral photo meme. Come yeah. on. What we're doing is perfecting their software for them. Right. I don't well, know. Well, that's true across the board, right? I mean, every bit of feedback we give every big data company is helping them, you know, uh, helping them improve the quality of their models. And, and just to target us and to sell us things and to get us sure. to watch things and consume things. So we, we're, uh, we're doing this to ourselves as long as we this know is, it. This is going even beyond that point. This is saying that, you know, they make reference to um, – AI already develops movie trailers that some believe approach the impact of their human-generated counterparts. You be the judge. Check out the first AI-produced movie trailer. Well, Tom, okay, a movie trailer is not a storytelling. Um, right. It's not a story told, right? Right. It's an it's an attention captured. Um, it's a completely different thing to string together a bunch of highlights. It's not. By the way, it, first of all, it's not hard to find movie highlights. They're strong. They're you know scattered throughout a film it's easy to find the highlights it's where most stuff is happening right so the idea of building a trailer out of that frankly that's that's low-hanging fruit for ai now telling a coherent story through ai is a whole other matter they talk about you know uh intelligent creation there's a reason why so many movies and television shows are crap it's because intelligent creation isn't all that intelligent even when humans do it right <laughs> exactly no one knows and anything. then you look at reality television, which, of course, is the biggest category of television there is, and you say, well, where's the intelligent creation here? I mean... <laughs> Maybe don't. we don't want intelligent creation. Maybe we don't. <laughs> so, um, so the theory is that AI is going to reshape the entertainment industry. We'll see. Uh, I don't think it's going to be happening that way. Let me skip ahead a little bit more here. Uh, 5G networks is another one of the predictions. Once that comes out, it really enables all kind of virtual and... Uh, augmented reality capabilities, which will change the way we interact with technology and get us away from that thing that's been around for years, you know, 30 years now, which is that screen. If you look at like old movies and you see people interacting with their big desktop computers, I mean, the screen itself is not appreciably different. It's a rectangle of certain dimensions, right? It's the way we've been in and mice, right? Mouse that we use and keyboards, there's nothing new about this stuff. And the point is, in the next five to ten years, we're going to move beyond the generation that brought us the iPhone, beyond the generation that brought us the smart speaker, to, um, to more, uh, uh, more immersive ways of interacting with this technology. I think that's inevitable. Oh, so yeah. it'll be interesting oh, to yeah, see no, the way that affects everything. Yeah, the clickers will go away. It'll be voice. We'll be talking to our TV. I mean, obviously. you know, I don't know about... I mean, one of the big things with the 5G is was to enable all this uh, video content on phones. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. How much long form content do you watch on your phone? I don't watch uh, much. None. <laughs> yeah. no, none. Yeah. None. But 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 when you get to uh, uh, iPads and so on, then it's a different story. I think those are much more likely used for that kind of purpose. But your point remains the same: that if we have a comfortable gadget that isn't ridiculous to wear that we're willing to wear, that uh, provides uh, this value proposition to us, people are going to embrace it. You know, exactly. I mean, the, the piece makes a reference to the fact that, look, 15 years ago, whoever thought we would be tethered to our mobile devices every hour of every waking day? It would be absurd. I remember not that long ago when my wife walked into a restaurant to meet some friends. She had a mobile phone just for safety because people did that then. And everybody laughed at her. <laughs> yeah, see, that's it. I and mean she, and she was drinking smart water, and they laughed at her about that. And now everyone's got phones with smart water. So um, it, it, that which is oddball becomes routine in a, in a very short period of time. And I think that time window is getting smaller and smaller. No, you're, look, you're absolutely right. Listen, you, you know, what were the, the crazy glasses that never caught on, right? Because they didn't, they didn't really They were look, ridiculous. They, they, right. looked, they, they looked foolish. Right. Well, I'll tell you what. Look up uh, Bose just released these frames called Rondo. Mm -hmm. They're audio sunglasses. They're cool-looking <laughs> sunglasses. You don't have earbuds. It plays the music like through these, you know, through the 
part of the glasses that rests on your temple and go mm-hmm. like right into your ears. So, so you look at some, nice. they call it open ear audio. And it's all nice. Blue, yeah, it's all Bluetooth enabled and everything. So nobody even knows you're listening because they don't see any earbuds and you're wearing designer sunglasses. That's great. So it's That's things great. like that. It's to integrate it into exactly how we live and how we want to look and feel while we're doing it. And, and can I just say, and I'm going to come back to this when I do the rants and raves, but can I just say that every one of these trends is implications. If you're selling anything, if you're trying to move people to your content, if you're video, if you're audio, if you're, you know, creating real goods in the real world, and you have to think about how all this technology is going to interface with what you do and change what you do. I mean, the idea that people would be buying razors right. online, you know, and have a subscription. Yep. That people would be getting kits of, of, of preparable meals shipped to them every week. I mean, these are absurd, fundamentally absurd concepts. Uh, Mike, it's only, only a few absurd years ago. because it, it's not here yet. What I told the executives at the American Banking Association 15 years ago, I gave, I gave a keynote and I said, you guys better hurry up. People are going to stop banking online. They all said I was an idiot. <laughs> Uh, you're no listening one to me. will do that, they said. You are listening to – well, they were wrong. And they are all now happily retired, hopefully. Exactly. You're listening to Media Unplugged with Tom Masacker and Mark Ramsey. Amazon's new ad strategy, free samples. I thought this was cool. This was from uh, Axios. And uh, the piece said, uh, free samples based on what it knows about you. Here we go with big data and AI again, right? Yep. So the idea here is that Amazon's uh, uh, plotting – a program that lets brands that have stuff to sell, you know, the brands that you would see in the department store, in the supermarket, anywhere else where stuff is sold, to deliver free samples to consumers based on what Amazon already knows you're likely to buy. Mm. Technically, you could think of it as turning free samples into a targeted ad play. Because what is a targeted ad? But an, uh, but a message that comes to you because you are more likely to respond to that message than someone else is. Well... You know, a free sample is kind of the ultimate targeted ad, isn't it? Because it allows you to actually taste the stuff that's coming to you if you're dealing with a product that exists in the real world or wear the item that's coming to you, a, a sample of the item that's coming to you, if it came down to that. So I thought this was so interesting. And what's also interesting is this entire article is drawn essentially from assessing the job postings at Amazon. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, they, they, what, first of all, what's your take on this, Tom? Well, look, I mean, it, it's brilliant. If you really think through it, I mean, imagine Amazon does a, you know, they send a recipient a sample based on what they've, this AI, what they've discovered. Mm-hmm. And imagine that a few days after you received it, because they know when you receive it. They have all the shipping right. data and everything, right? right. So right. It's right after they figure that, okay, he received it, he probably tried it. Now you get a link to a discount sure. on the product, right? right. That adds, you click it, and it adds it directly to your shopping cart. They can right. do all this seamlessly. Yes. Right? So this is, this, I, don't, I hope people understand how powerful this is. But it, it's completes, going, it, it completes the circuit. Uh, absolutely. But it has to be handled strategically. It has to be done to start with with low interest brands, right? Something where somebody says, okay, I, yeah, I don't mind trying that paper towel. You know, this one's good, but I'll try that. Oh, look, they sent it to me. It, this works really well. Let me throw a case of this into my shopping cart. You know, it's a little different if you're, if you're a brand loyalist, mm-hmm. which, which they probably know, you see. And if they know you're a brand loyalist because they've been watching this thing that you've been buying over and over again, they're not going to send you a sample of that. They, well, they're how trying about to move for, you, right? Yeah. How about for products which are which are you know, uh, you may be a brand loyalist, but the product fundamentally is commodity ish, differentiated by the power of whatever the brand conveys. And here I get a sample of something that's functionally equivalent, but a you know a different brand. And now you have the capacity to move me just through that message. Yeah, that's what I mean, and that's what I mean sample. by yeah. That's what I mean by strategic, right? So they use this. They use the data to say, what kind of product is this? Let's say you're buying a tub of uh, whey protein powder, 
once a month because, you know, you were working out and you're doing that. And they, they discover this and they say, okay, this is whey protein powder. Let's send them a tub of this sample protein mm-hmm. powder. And mm-hmm. you try it and you go, wow, that's good. And it's cheaper and you switch. So you're right. right. Anything where the brand is trying to send a signal that this really isn't a commodity product, they're mm-hmm. going to be in trouble. So now let's extend this a little bit because this makes perfect sense for the things we see in a grocery store, maybe even a department store. But, you know, if you're shopping for clothes, you can't give me a sample of a sweater, right? So how, how does this scale? Does this scale? Well, this is what I'm trying to tell you again. So let's say you're shopping for clothes and they, the AI said, hey, look, this guy's buying these gray T-shirts. So again, it, it has to do with whether there's a substitute so if they can send me a gray T-shirt that fits just as well, that's cheaper and is good quality, maybe I say, okay, why am I buying these expensive gray T-shirts when this one looks just as good? So it, yeah, but I'm, but I'm saying, where's the, there's no sample there, right? That's not part of the sample strategy because the sample strategy only works. Oh for no, those things. oh yeah, this is repeat purchase, right? Something that's a consumable, something that mm-hmm. that that mm-hmm. you know you use over and over that. that runs out (laughs) right yeah it's interesting though because you could conceive that um giving you a taste of a tv show giving you a taste of a film giving you a taste of a song Uh, are all legitimate sampling opportunities right yes they are a taste is big i mean just ask that guy at the mall who gives you a piece of that chinese chicken on a toothpick that moves a lot of product when people are walking by that you know that food court yeah, I don't know where that toothpick's been, so I don't patronize <laughs> that guy. But it, what I think also inherent in this in this conversation is, look, Amazon can do this because they have a massive number of customers. They have a massive v- uh, volume of relationships with those customers and trust with those customers. And because they have all this data and all these relationships and have the distribution platform front to back and, and sideways, they can do this whereas others can't. Right? Okay, but so here's the question for you then. Why aren't they doing it with something as simple as books? So, for example, they have the data of everyone who bought my books mm-hmm. and who gave them four- and five-star reviews, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why can't they use their AI, target those people when I come out with a new book, send them a chapter, and say, you love this guy's last book, Here's a chapter from his new book. If you like it, here's a link to the Kindle, to the paperback, whatever. Well, they they have that. It's just not push. When you follow an author, which I do for some people, I do get an email saying so-and-so has a new book out. Uh, and then you can click through to, to, to access it that way. So in a sense, they've got that. What you're saying is, look, the minute you buy a book from an author, you are infinitely more likely to buy another book from that author. Exactly. You know, if you buy one James Patterson, you're more likely to buy a second James Patterson. Why not auto-follow? Why not auto make you auto-follow this person right. such that you can you know, opt out if you wish down the road? And I think that's a great point. Or I think music. they should. Or songs, right? Uh, absolutely, because yeah. honestly, whenever I've gotten one of those emails, my first thought is, oh, I've followed that guy. That's why they're sending me this. Right. Um, this might actually be good, and it really does work. You're right. So All right, you'll... Tom, it's, it's time for rants and raves. Okay. So th- this isn't a rant. It, it would have been a rant years ago, and it's, and it's not a rave. Call it an observation about the uh, drift of media. All right, especially okay. in this age right. of abundance. Okay. Now, I don't remember exactly when this happened. Say it was half a dozen years ago. It was probably longer than that. But I was getting ready to present to a large organization, and I wanted to visually show them how the quality of media storytelling had rapidly evolved. Mm. All right, I wanted them to see it with their eyes so that they could see what was going on because it's hidden when you see it over time. So I I said, okay, I chose a televised professional football game. That that was what I was going to use as my glaring example because I remember what it looked like back in the 80s compared to what it looks like today. Hmm. It's it's ridiculously different, okay? 
So mm -hmm. I said, okay, this is perfect. I'll go get a couple of 10 second clips. I go on YouTube and I'm searching everywhere to find a few clips of NFL football game. Okay. Nothing. You mean from from uh, from the eighties? No, no, yeah, I didn't care. From the eighties and from today. Oh, any, any, I see, any. There okay. was not one NFL game video clip anywhere on YouTube. It was it, it blew my mind. I said, "What in the not not even uploaded by anyone? With mm. like that did you know took a shot of their with of their TV and put it on nothing." Wow. So, so I'm going, "What the hell is going on?" And my guess is. The NFL probably threatened to sue Google and anybody else who posted anything without their permission. Sure, sure. I call up a friend of mine, and he, and my friend is good friends with the producer of Monday Night Football. So that guy, the producer, he puts me in touch with his, an associate at NFL Films. That's the one who handles all of the distribution of all this content, right? Mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. the deal making. So I, I don't know who I'm on the phone with. It's probably a lawyer or something. And I explain... I'm looking for a couple of 10-second clips of an NFL game. I said any games would work, something from the 80s, something, you know, recent. And he, okay, and he emails me this form with all kinds of usage projections. How many people are going to see this thing? How often am I going to show these clips? And then Is there, there was, a fee? Oh, ridiculously high fee. Wow. Uh, all kinds of legal mumbo-jumbo. So I decide... I'm not going to use this as an example, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward. Like I said, this is only like five to ten years. Fast forward. After watching the two NFL division championship games this past Sunday, I went to YouTube to see if I could find a particular play that had happened Sunday. I went there Monday morning, and I looked. You know what I found on YouTube? What would you find? Both games in the entirety with mm. all of the timeouts, the delays, and advertisements stripped out. For free on YouTube. For free on YouTube, you could watch the highlights of both games that you watch Sunday on Monday. So, guess what? Everything has changed because even What's the most powerful media brands are finally mm. recognizing they are no longer the bee's knees, man. You know, whatever. The cat's pajamas, <laughs> the fox's socks, whatever the hell. Of, every, do, do you see what I'm saying? Wow. I could, it was unbelievable, the shift. That is amazing. It was. That is amazing. What and a how contrast. Much, how many years separated those two experiences? Oh, seven. I don't know. Wow. It, it wow, was which, huge. That's amazing. Um, I have a couple. I, uh, the first one's kind of a rave. No, it is a rave. Uh, and then this one I just got today. One of the things I subscribe to is a service called Trend Watching at trendwatching.com, which I really do strongly recommend. They have today, an email came out, the innovation of the day. And it's a platform from uh, Belgium, uh, which is spelled such that it's unpronounceable <laughs> in English. It's N-J-O-M-L-Y. So there you go. Your guess is as good as mine. It's a platform for foodies... Creating it's it's a it's got it's a got a live streaming feature. It lets customers interact with top chefs and specialists, and of course, it sells you things. It is in the to it, to uh, coin uh, to use the coin phrase the trend watching users because they're really good at creating, you know, pithy little phrases. <laughs> it's called shop streaming, shop. Well, which is so interesting. Shop streaming. So the idea is that. It's a live streaming uh, network. You get to see what's going on, interact with the chefs in real time, and, of course, you can buy the stuff while you're watching it. That sounds an awful like, like something we used to call the home shopping network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Right? Yeah. If you think about it, what's the most exciting part of the home shopping network? Well, it's when they get those people on there who just love this Capitamonte bowl and they go on and on about how many they bought for Aunt Bertha and, you know, Cousin <laughs> Millie. And, and uh, it, it's these call-ins are like the way of interacting. And now here we are at a time when, the, forget the call-ins, you're now interacting in real time, but you're interacting uh, with a video platform while everyone else is also interacting with their video platform and being sold something all at the same time. 
Uh, there's another thing called NYX launching a new service that lets customers live stream with beauty experts and buy things at the same time. This whole uh, this is this is the transformation of shopping into experience and video into shopping uh, and live streaming wrapped around the whole thing. And it's really, really interesting. And I think to me what it again illustrates is that no matter what business you're in, even broadcasting business, radio business, I don't care. You really need to recognize that this technology can uh, in, in, can broaden your proposition, can allow you to do more things. The thing, what I always ask people is this: because you do blank, whatever it is you do, mm. what does that enable you to do? Because you're, let's say, a radio station with a large audience. Let's say one of my Christian clients, a Christian broadcaster with a large audience, technically, effectively, the largest church in town, right? Right. What does that enable you to do? What can you do because you have this? How can you touch people? How can you reach people? How can you interact with people? How can you leverage technology to take yourself from being a quote unquote radio station or a quote unquote, you know, restaurant into something completely different and much larger? How could you leverage shop streaming? You know? Yep. It's a really interesting puzzle, but it's so critical uh, to allow people to rethink what they do in an age when. Uh, you know, it's cliche, but man, if you don't disrupt yourself, it's going to be done for you. Oh, it's common. <laughs> Absolutely. So my second is more of a, a rant, I think. Um, and yeah, I can only allude to some of the stuff I have here because these are numbers that are I, – I, I have some numbers that I'm not supposed to have from the company that does all the radio ratings. And I'm not going to, uh, you know, detail those numbers. I'm only going to speak in terms of generalities and trends. Um I think there's change underfoot that people aren't recognizing, and specifically if you work in the radio industry, I've got data here from several large markets that evaluates, uh, you know, mar large markets that are metered, where technology, not diaries, are determining the ratings. Right. And if you look at their ratings in, uh, for example, I've got five markets here. Um, if you look at the n average number of people who listen, not to any given station, but to radio, period, okay, um, uh, from year to year, from December to December, or November to November, whatever, um, the decline, it's, first of all, it's a decline across the board, the average number of, of people listening, uh, ranging from anywhere from 4% to, in one market, 16%. That is a one-year decline in terms of the average number of people listening to radio at all right now from 4 to 16%. Now, that's irrespective of demographics. I have heard through the grapevine from people who have seen the numbers up close that when you look at these numbers demographically, in other words, under 45, let's say, ages under 45, uh, the percentage of decline could be as high as 40% in the space of one year. Wow. Um, I've got other data that has the total number of, of, of people uh, listening to the radio from uh, in four markets from uh, the holidays, the so-called holiday ratings period last year to the holiday ratings period this year. So some part of December, you know, Christmas season, everyone should be listening to the radio, right? Because that's Christmas music. Why wouldn't they listen? Right. Um, I've got four markets and the average decline in total number of people using the radio in that time is seven to, between seven and 8% um, in one year. And then I hear from people, yeah, we're seeing declines every single month. It ticks down. So it's not even, it's not even evening out. So uh, the, 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 the consequence here is profound for a couple of reasons. First, because the large groups are utterly freaking out about this, uh, desperately trying to keep this information from going public. Look, I'm not writing about this. I'm putting it on this, this podcast, but I'm not going to publish anything about this because it helps no one. You know, it doesn't help anyone. Uh, but they're trying to keep it quiet because they don't want the advertisers to get a hold of this for obvious reasons. Because advertisers, as you know, Tom, don't need reasons not to buy. There's already so many of them. Yeah, I know. So uh, then the other thing that occurs to me is this invariably will carry us towards a place of, consoli of further consolidation. Because what's going to happen is the people in the radio business are going to look up and say there are fewer people listening to radio at all. Um, thus, I need to own more of the distribution channel in order to, you know, to, to keep my revenue flat. I need to own more of the distribution channel and I need to have fewer employees working at it, right? 
Yep. So let me consolidate more stations under fewer owners. Let me consolidate fewer employees under fewer owners and fewer and more stations. And thus, let me at least stay even with where I was last year and the year before that in a time when fewer people than ever are listening to the radio. And by the way, these statistics, all of them, predate the presence of, um, of, uh, Google, uh, of, of Google Home and uh, Alexa in the car. As you know, those devices are only now beginning to appear. Uh, the device for uh, Alexa is, has, is, is on in, uh, invitation-only pre-order right now. There are supposedly a million pre-orders for that device so that people can plug it in in their car, connect it to Bluetooth, and operate everything that way. When you have one of these devices in your car and you can say, you know, uh, hey, Google, play Lady Gaga, um, that's what you're going to do. Whoops, there's my Google playing. Hey, hey Google, stop. <laughs> <laughs> See, it just works. It's amazing. That's what you're going to do. The number one place for radio consumption is in the car. So when those devices enter the car en masse, you're going to see a huge decline in the volume of uh, people who listen to the radio over time. It's going to be traumatic. All of this is happening, by the way, because over the years, radio broadcasters in particular have decided that they would rather be, they would rather depend on commodity content, um, ease of use, uh, ubiquity and habit, rather than creating something which stands out and demands people to pay attention to it and consume it. That went to podcasts. Oh, yeah. That went to public radio. Yeah. So there's my rant for you. What we're going to see is uh, we're, we, I've always expected, I've seen, there's been a regular downtrend in the average number of people listening to the radio. There hasn't until recently, I haven't seen, a decline in the raw number of people using radio. That's fairly new. My belief, by the way, if you look at where these stats peak, the biggest de uh, declines are in markets that are big technology markets. So think about that next time you use that smart speaker and ask yourself, could this be doing more harm than good for radio? Um, I'll shut up, Tom. Go ahead. No, I mean, look, <clears throat> it ha it's already happening in the car, especially with people who are interested in listening to talk. I mean, how many podcasts are there? I, I, <laughs> 500,000, it's just, <laughs> no. it, it's out of control, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the only thing that's preventing it right now, I, I would think, is is music. But like you said, that that's coming too. If I can get the perfect podcast, whether it comes from a broadcast source or not, if I can get the perfect podcast whenever I want, and if I can get the perfect mix of songs whenever I want, explain to me again why I need the radio. No, that's my point. It's especially, look, you, you start becoming conditioned not to like interruptions. It was, we were watching something the other day, but it wasn't, it was on a paid a channel with commercials. And, and my wife said, these interruptions are a pain in the ass. And I said, they're only a pain because we've been watching so much Netflix and Amazon Prime and there aren't any. So right. now it's starting to stand out. So that's right. So that's what's happening now. When people get conditioned to go to YouTube, hit this channel on there that plays somebody's or a certain type of music, and they have all of these channels, mm -hmm. and you can just listen, just sit there and listen to your type of music just continuously stream on Bluetooth through your phone. Mm -hmm. Why are you going to listen to something with commercial interruptions? Well, that's and that that again that there's why Hulu reduced the price of their ad supported tier. Right. And by the way, here's my prediction: that price is going to go to zero. That price will eventually go to zero on on Hulu's ad supported option. Okay. Um, because uh, that's called television. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is Media Unplugged for this week. We went super long, but hopefully it was uh, worthwhile for you. Please remember to subscribe to us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you are listening right now. You can follow Tom on Twitter and Tom A. Oh, Tom, I want to give you a chance before we go. Um, you have a new learning program. Yes, I do. Please mention it. It is called How to Be Alive. And um, it's four years I've been working on it. It's uh, mm. launched last week. It's already got a great response. Uh, people can check out 
what it's all about at uh, stayaliveorbealive.com. I'm trying to get people to get off of this wheel of routine and, and, and mm-hmm. businesses, individuals, whoever it is that, that are stuck. Uh, there's a way out. And it's not as scary as it seems. And uh, that's what the program is about. Yeah, if you if you have at all groove uh, with the stuff that Tom writes, the t- stuff that Tom talks about, you must check this out. Stayalive.com, BeAlive.com are the two sites, right? Uh, stayaliveorbealive.com. I mean, it's one, it's one word? Yeah. Stay alive or be alive? Well, that's your choice. It's stay alive or be alive. There's, <laughs> there's, there's no other choice in life but that. Or you can find it at, also at howtobealive.org. Okay, great. <laughs> um, you can follow Tom on Twitter at Tom Asak or in Mark at Mark Ramsey Media. Send us your questions and comments using hashtag Media Unplugged. And if there's a media topic you want us to cover, tweet us. You can also email us at mramsey at markramseymedia.com and Tom Asak or at gmail.com. Catch up on older, as I call them, vintage episodes <laughs> at our website, mediaunplugged.net. Special thanks to the producer of Media Unplugged, the one, the only Jeff Schmidt. Exciting audio for media. You can find him at jeff Schmidt. Dot com. For Tom Maysacker, I'm Mark Ramsey. Thank you for listening. 